Good morning. It's today is Tuesday, and today we're having a very, very interesting webinar. And please mute your microphones, and if you want to mute your videos too. If you have any questions, please make sure that you put them in the chat box, and then at the end we will have time to make some questions for our guest today and um, most likely we'll have a um, good time to make the answers uh, worthwhile for you all. And as always, the session will be recorded and it's gonna be posted on our YouTube channel, Low It Group, and it's gonna be available for all of you tomorrow to share and enjoy. So uh, let me continue. Let me introduce you to uh, my brother, Juan Carlos, who is the CEO of Lowit. And uh, Juan, if you want to share. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining. It's a pleasure to have you. And um, just to give you kind of a quick update on uh, what we are and why we're doing these events. Uh, just on a few comments for those who may not know us. Lowit is the legal tech and legal innovation arm of logistic. And what we do basically is we provide consulting services to law departments and law firms offering practical ways to improve efficiency, quality, and outcome. That's kind of uh, the focus on what we do and we'll further comment on, on the idea of these webinars. And as you all know, we're facing a moment of unprecedented uncertainty, but we also like to see it more as an opportunity time and it is crucial to rapidly learn the tools and concepts and frameworks that enable us to understand and shape the future of law. Uh, there's a lot of things what, that were uh, happening in the past and now with this COVID-19 uh, normal, there's a lot of things that now it's a must and not a nice to have. And well, we are taking advantage of this technology to share with you and with all our friends um, using technology, whatever is available for us in the market. And today's is not gonna be an exception. But uh, Juan, if you wanna share a little bit what uh, these webinars are. We have been organizing these events uh, to share relevant content dealing with the business of law, legal technology and innovation. That has been the, the focus of the events and our commitment is always to invite experts and industry leaders to share their views and, and comment on key trends and matters that have a significant impact on the practice of law. And obviously today is uh, a very special event because we have one of those global leaders uh, joining us to present what I think is a key topic, not only for those uh, buying legal services, but for anyone kind of using the legal services and, and how to benefit of it. And Alex will briefly introduce Brian Kuhn and then we'll get started. Well, Brian is the Vice President and General Manager, uh, Digital Strategy and Solutions at Elevate Services. He's gonna be talking today about how law firms can use their own data to improve their client experience and increase market share. And um, for all of those who may not know Brian, he is a very, very well-known expert in artificial intelligence, especially in the industry of law. And he's probably mostly known for being the, the beginning and the spirit of um, IBM's Watson legal part. And well, that was uh, a few years ago, but at that time it was kind of Star Wars themes and now uh, artificial intelligence is all over the place. But he has been helping customers to develop into the uh, digital transformation strategies that we have been talking about in these webinars. So in his experience, uh, we're gonna be learning a lot from him today uh, on what is happening in the industry today and how this has been being implemented in law firms in-house and um, other uh, areas of law. So Brian, if you want to share your screen, I'm gonna 
close mine and then you're on. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And this is just to confirm that you can, can you see my screen? Uh, be coming up uh, any second. We see you now, but not the screen. One moment. Just one moment. Sometimes it takes a few minutes to my second. Yeah, don't, don't worry. And just well, well, we see your uh, slides. Why don't you, uh, well, Brian is joining us from Washington, DC. It's one of those rare moments that he sits in uh, where he lives because he's always on the plane. Obviously, has not been doing that for the past three or four months. But uh, we're ready to to learn from his experiences in the digital world and some of the topics that we mentioned in our promotional materials and on LinkedIn and and the emails that we sent is that this talk will be really aiming at. Uh, for law firms to find the treasures that they have inside uh, that maybe they are not taking advantage of. And uh, with this uh, experience and the tools that uh, Brian will comment, I think it will be a completely new perspective on the, on the business of law for anyone in this, in this industry. So I think we're starting to see the, the slides, Brian. All right, wonderful. So as these slides are coming up, first of all, thank you for your time today. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, I will say that uh, one of the themes that we'll be discussing today is the use of law firm data to fuel custom artificial intelligence solutions and custom strategies. Uh, it, it turns out that legal technology has become quite good um, and has followed the maturity curve of technology in other industries, particularly uh, fintech, insurtech. Um, and some of the lessons learned in those spaces have translated through into the legal tech space where over 1 billion uh, US dollars uh, was invested globally um, last year and in the year before. And that's up from 200 and I think 76 million in 2017. So there's, the market has, has discovered legal technology as a space to invest. But, uh, but what we'll discuss today is not technology per se, but the application of technology. When most of us think about AI and technology, we think about it in terms of products. But the future is not about products. The future is about capabilities. In other words, taking the, the, the capabilities that you would think of that go into making a product, machine learning, natural language processing, analytics, and taking them apart like, lo like, like, like blocks or Legos so that you can wrap them around your data and your business of law needs rather than one size all, which is where the need for a transformation strategy comes into play. So one slide about us and then we'll move on. Uh, so Elevate's digital strategy and solutions business, which I am honored to lead focuses on consult to deploy digital strategy, meaning we create custom technology solutions for our customers, law departments and law firms. And uh, those technology solutions are part of strategy engagements. In other words, uh, we might work on a strategy engagement to reduce cost for a law department, and we execute on that strategy by custom configuring technology. And we can custom configure technology much faster and much more cost effectively than was possible at say IBM a few years ago. Uh, this, this, this process has become a lot more cost effective. And so uh, rather than just building technology and assuming that we know what people need, uh, which we don't and no one really does, now we can, I think do the, we and, and others like us can do the right thing and ask find out, uh, do due diligence, uh, analyze our customers' processes and their data, and create strategies that align to their particular business needs, 
everything from what they see on a screen, the insight they see on a screen, uh, to, um, uh, to, to the look and feel, uh, should reflect what you want to accomplish as an individual business, uh, as an individual law firm. Now, just a few points, very briefly, for, uh, for the sake of context. Um, I'm gonna use a few phrases in this discussion, and I'd like to, to define them. Um, this slide is meant to convey the fact that uh, when I say digital, I mean multiple technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, natural language processing. When I say digital, it's an umbrella term. When I say digitization, I mean converting uh, uh, traditionally analog or paper processes to digital processes. Now that's different from digital transformation. When I say digital transformation, so digitization is about workflow efficiency. Uh, digital transformation is about creating new value by using technology to do things that human beings cannot do. Pardon me. It's not about replacing people. It's about doing things that people could never do in the first place. People cannot read a million documents and remember everything that they read, identify patterns and concepts and trends, and forecast future risk and do so consistently. Um, we'll discuss what, what, what interplay those, those concepts have as we move on. And then finally, when I say data, I'm discussing your data not uh, third-party data, not uh, uh, vendor data, but behind the firewall, law firm in this case, could be law department too, but law firm data. And to set the market context, I, th I think this is important. Um, over the last two decades, advancements in digital technologies, like those that, we've, that we just mentioned, uh, have, have created new expectations. In other words, um, they've created expectations, consumer grade expectations around ease of use. And that's changed what customers perceive as reasonable, uh, reasonable prices, um, reasonable service. Uh, and this is happening across industries. It, it, it's actually quite remarkable. Um, I, I am ashamed to say I did not know this, but last year I found out that uh, globally, 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars are spent on digital transformation. 1.2 trillion, uh, a third of all technology spending across industries, including, you know, our industry is in part of that too. Legal industry is in part of that too. What's driving all of that is the fact that uh, you have traditional legacy players like law firms who are respected and who, who are very good at what they do. Uh, but there's friction associated with doing business with them from their client's perspective. And so as the cost of technology has fallen, new competitors like legal technology providers will look at all the things that law firms do and, and will pick one and they'll do that one thing very, very well. And, you know, and, and, and it's, it might not be strategically important to the law firm, but they beginning, they begin, the competitors begin to take bites out of law firms value chain strategically, giving the clients of law firms options that they didn't have before, therefore changing expectations um, uh, around what, what a company is willing to pay a law, for, law firm for, uh, the scope of service, in other words, and the price. So uh, digital technology has created consumer grade expectations, and that has begun disrupting business models. And you know, I, I'll also say that uh, today's digital newcomers in the legal space look very different than they did even a few years ago. I mentioned in 2018, legal tech companies received investments totaling uh, about one billion, uh, up from 233 million actually in 2017. So that that was significant, and at first that was considered um, uh, an outlier by the market, an outlier event. But in 2019, that, that abnormality became a trend and legal tech companies received 1.2 billion uh, equivalent USD uh, global. Uh, but they didn't just receive money. These companies also received guidance from 
uh, business savvy investors, business savvy venture capitalists, you know, the, 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 the famous companies on Sand Hill Road in San Francisco and across the world um, who were giving them advice uh, that, that they would usually have given to players in other industries. Uh, again, I'm thinking financial technology or fintech uh, or, or medical tech, areas that are a bit further ahead when it comes to uh, technology, uh, although this industry is rapidly catching up. And then I also mentioned that uh, 1.2 trillion is the amount invested in digital transformation uh, across industries in 2019. So uh, there you, on the one hand, the legal industry takes a bit longer to adopt technology. Um, and there are many reasons for that. And there are many good reasons for that. Uh, on the other hand, changes are happening. And people have been saying that for a long time. And, uh, and they've been crying wolf. But these are, these are big seismic convergent changes that are occurring. Um, and you know, if you're a law firm, your clients are getting an education in digital transformation somewhere across their, their business, across their enterprise. Uh, they, are, they are doing something. It might not be in, in the legal department, uh, or it might be, but they're doing something with, with digital technology and AI and customization um, and reuse of their data. For example, there's a large bank in New York that uh, is seeking to use artificial intelligence to find uh, work product that, that outside counsel created for them in the past, uh, contracts, and repurpose it in whole or in part because they bought it, they own it, they store it, uh, without relying on outside counsel to, to create, to recreate the, 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 the contract from scratch for repeatable services. So, pardon me. So there's a real trend here, a real maturity curve here. And I would, I, I think if I may, you know, one of the most interesting things about it is that it's not actually about technology, which might seem a bit odd given everything I've just said. It's not about technology. Uh, you know, digital transformation and digitization are about the effect, the cumulative effect uh, of technological change on people and their expectations. You see, that's what we've been talking about. And, and it's about how this change uh, that technology creates on people and their expectations shifts buying power, shifts buying power in clients' favor by giving them more options. Cost of technology has come down. It's cheaper to experiment. And that means that more startups can go out and raise capital. Uh, it, the technology is also uh, easier to configure and customize. That's good. What's bad about that is there are so many options and it's difficult to find a starting place. Um, so despite what it might look like, these, these new law firm competitors uh, and particularly the legal tech companies aren't really competing on the basis of technology, but but rather on the basis to deliver uh, fast personalized service. Uh, and here, you know, the, the idea is that the last best experience that anyone has anywhere becomes the minimum standard for what they want everywhere else. Um, and that's a critical point. Uh, clients uh, have grown used to personalized intuitive service. So an obvious example here. Uh, let's, let's provide an example is, is the AI based review of high volume contracts. Um, so picking up on that, that theme we discussed earlier, so companies lose about 5% to 40% uh, of the value of a given deal due to what they say is inefficient contracting. And many companies create and review you know, obviously a massive number of contracts. Those contracts lack uniformity and they're challenging to, to organize and to review. AI-based software helps companies identify important information, uh, information that's important to them specifically, and, and identify risk and conduct review. And for some types of contract work, not all, but for some, uh, it also empowers companies to rely on fewer law firms. And these, these companies, these law departments, have come to expect a more cost-effective contract review experience based on uh, faster access to actionable insights, 
Um, and, and their default response is no longer to work for law, to hire law firms to do everything, but to hire law firms to do the more complex work. So that is an example of a change in expectations and in expectations around value. Um, the last point I'll make when it comes to uh, uh, the, sort of the overarching theme here, which is, which is again, uh, digital transformation, uh, data reuse, it's not about technology. The, the last point I'll make with regard to that is that buying technology is a step in the right direction, but it's, it's no longer enough if your clients can buy the same technology you can and use it to serve themselves. 43% of all legal work used to go to law firms has now been brought in-house through a combination of means. Uh, good technology is becoming table stakes. Um, the, the, the competitive the, uh, push forward is, is going to be based more on uh, how you configure technology, how you use technology, how you apply technology, not just that you have it, and particularly how you apply it to reduce friction for your end users, whether they are internal or whether they are your clients. And that might all seem a bit like doom and gloom, but actually I hope the, the, the conversation, the rest of the conversation today, uh, I, I hope to, to demonstrate to you that uh, there's an argument to be made, a solid argument to be made, I believe, that the future of legal technology uh, lies with law firms. And I don't, I don't mean that every law firm will be creating software or that they want to or should. Uh, I mean something else. Um, and, and it's based upon specifically opportunities to generate net new revenue um, and to massively reduce operating costs. And it is based upon data reuse. Um, you know, we all know that data is the foundation for businesses to drive smarter decisions or it's becoming the foundation for businesses to do that um, and to memorialize best practices. It's what fuels transformation, but uh, you know, for, for most companies, according to Forrester research, uh, most companies, um, and this includes law firms, only use 15 to 25% of their legacy data. And that's data, uh, a, a wealth, a treasure trove of data that has information about you, your, your, your financial health, your, your, your clients, patterns and trends, uh, connections that could be made to help you predict things, um, to help you predict outcomes, budgets, staffing, um, uh, settlement timings. Um, I'll provide some concrete examples uh, towards the end. Um, uh, we can get less theoretical and more specific, but uh, 15 to 25%. And that's shocking because you know, 80% of the world's law firm data sits behind law firm firewalls. Vendors don't have it. Vendors will almost never have it. So you know, law firms have the data, the expertise to contextualize it, to train it, in other words. Uh, they have established brands and they have existing networks of clients versus technology vendors. Most technology vendors, particularly when it comes to artificial intelligence, struggle to, uh, to get enough data to train their systems. And they struggle to contextualize that data. Uh, a bunch of data scientists uh, are not necessarily going to understand the complex nuances in terms of art um, that, allow, that allow you to disambiguate legal concepts as lawyers. Perhaps they'll be aided with lawyers, but even then, uh, are those lawyers subject matter experts? Is, is the vendor basically training their AI based upon representative data and based upon, uh, and with the aid of, of, of relevant subject matter experts? Or is it all math? Because math is not enough. It's, it's math is not know-how, math is statistics. The way, however, the, the, the way that you as a law firm uh, address certain issues is your know-how and you should be able to uh, train a tool um, or inform a tool to think like you and to reflect 
the, the, the way you do, the way that you reason and, and the processes that you have in place. Uh, one size fits all artificial intelligence solutions are helpful for back office and middle office functions. Um, so, you know, for, for uh, enterprise legal management sorts of functions, but they struggle to provide insights that you can make strategic business decisions on. Are you going to make strategic pricing decisions based upon uh, training data that may or may not be representative of your firm, that may or may not be relevant, that may or may not be trained by who, who, who uh, that's the question, who trained that data? Um, probably not. And that's one of the, one of the things that's holding AI back in our, uh, in our industry is that it lacks a certain trustworthiness. It turns out though, that you have the data to provide uh, that kind of level of, of, of self-trust um, and, and general purpose technology tools, again, while, be, while, while beneficial, uh, won't really be able to do that um, uh, because they won't, they won't reflect your workflows and your data and your business goals. Um, if you didn't train them, and again, AI is all about context, uh, uh, who did, as I said. So with that in mind, um, how do you get that information out of your heads and into a tool efficiently? Uh, you begin by asking, first and foremost, uh, what problem to solve? You know, you, know your, you know your goals, your challenges, your problems, but you might not know the exact scope of them. I imagine, for example, that uh, someone gives you a map um, and it's, it's, it's a map of, of a country, a map of Switzerland, let's say. Uh, but there are no rivers, there are no roads, uh, there are no towns, there are no cities. Uh, you have an outline but the shape of the problem is unique unto you. It has a texture that's yours and yours alone. And understanding the right problem to solve with how do you use your data to fuel an artificial intelligence or a digital solution, um, you know, for whom, how, why, uh, how do you go about identifying where to begin? Um, because, because there are no easy answers. And plug and play technology, um, again, it's helpful, but it's rarely transformative uh, unless it solves your version of, of, you know, of a broader business problem than it can be based again on your data, your business objectives and your realities. I, I will keep, keep hammering at that. Um, it, it comes, it, it, I'll provide you with a, some insights into a process. This is, what, this is what we and others like us do. We would do this, Deloitte would do this, Accenture would do this. Uh, the idea of helping you use design thinking and other methods to identify your why, defining the right use cases and success criteria um, uh, uh, you know, is, is absolutely important. And it goes hand in hand with having a strategy, a roadmap. Before you ask how, uh, you're gonna approach the tactics of, of using technology or digital transformation identify your why. Why is your current situation problematic? Why do you need to change it? Whatever the answer is, try to avoid and if we build it, they will come approach, um, which is where many in other industries have failed and they've learned hard lessons uh, that we don't have to relearn together because those are expensive lessons. Um, you know, uh, uh, what, what often didn't happen was linking of technology to business goals. So in looking across industries that have been successful with digital transformation um, and with reusing their, their, their own technology, uh, again, FinTech, uh, uh, life, uh, healthcare, life sciences, uh, telco, retail, um, oil and gas, insurance. Um, the, the benefits are often cited as improved efficiency, which, drive, which drives cost takeout and, uh, and increases revenue, um, those two things. And so, you know, it makes sense to begin to look at low hanging fruit, like where can you take out operational costs? Um, where can you improve the client experience? So if you can align taking out operational costs with improving the client experience, that's ideal. Uh, and where can you grow revenue? 
by leveraging insights from your data to improve, um, to improve the customer experience by productizing your data. And I'll offer you three suggestions here. Um, and I'm going to kind of skip a bit, but the first suggestion is to use design thinking. Um, and you know, design thinking, it's a structured approach for problem solving, uh, just as lawyers use a structured approach to prepare for trial. Uh, and it's, it's all about defining the right problem to solve and, and how to solve them before any money is invested in technology. You know, you, you, you should, who any, for anybody who does this with you or for you, you should expect it to be done at no cost. Uh, you should expect a business case uh, and you should expect you know, a technological blueprint uh, so that you know whether or not there's a there there. The goals are, is it desirable? Will people want to use it? Whatever the technology is, uh, however it's configured or customized, uh, will they want to use it? I.e., will it be adopted? Uh, is it economically viable? Um, is, is, it, is it something that you, you're okay achieving over time? Uh, is it too expensive? Uh, is the ROI unjustified? Um, does it not make sense now, but perhaps later? And is it technically feasible? Is this something that can be built? Or is this something that it, with relative ease, fast? Or is this something that's going to take three years and it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, Star Wars? Um, and some organizations want that. Most don't. Um, that's that's obviously very hard to justify right now in the current economic environment. Design thinking, uh, a last slide on design thinking has, you know, those are the business purposes. But the real soul of it is putting yourself in the shoes of the end user. And, you know, most in the past, most technology vendors would, would, would build technology and assume, again, assume that they knew what their end user wanted. Um, and so they would throw in a bunch of features that you might or might not want. Um, uh, again, back to digital transformation, the more a vendor knows you, uh, the more that they can anticipate your actual needs, the more they ask you, the, the closer this is going to be. So a bicycle, a tool, is not a user experience. You know, riding in a race is a user experience in this case. Uh, going to work, taking your, your child uh, uh, you know, um, to the market or uh, you know, um, farmer's market in, uh, in this case, or um, you know, playing when you were a child with, uh, with your best friend. Those are, those are the things, the experiences, the outcomes that people remember, not just a tool. Um, and what are the other two? So, you know, um, I want to improve the client experience. Okay, that's design thinking, and, and that should be incorporated into everything. But the second is, <clears throat> sounded like I was 15. The second is automation and insight. Um, in other words, how might you improve client facing processes? So I want to use our data to fuel internal automation and insight. Okay. Uh, where do client, clients experience the most friction with you today? You would use design thinking to imagine that um, and to imagine it from their perspective. Uh, you are not your client. And I say that very respectfully. That's not meant to be uh, cheeky. Um, we say it too internally. Uh, we are not our end user. We are not our client. And we do understand our clients. We do understand our end users, uh, but they understand themselves better. And there's an opportunity there based upon that fact. Uh, if you could, therefore, for number two, if you could actuate your hard won know how as a law firm, what would the customer experience and economic benefits be? And here are several thoughts. One would be to create a knowledge base. So uh, this is a step up from knowledge management. On average, law firm lawyers spend six hours. Uh, each per week, uh, searching for information, just searching for it before they even reuse it. Uh, that breaks down to about a 20% loss in productivity per lawyer per year. So a real ROI. Uh, traditional document management software really struggles here because it doesn't speak the language of law. If I say I'm feeling blue because it's raining cats and dogs, and I say that in the context of automobile bodily injury negligence, 
it means something very different than if I say it in the context of director and officer liability, for example. Um, and so taking that, that context into account is impossible with keyword searching. You know, uh, it, 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 it's really something that needs machine learning based on your data to understand the variations and, and colorations that come from you um, and the way you interpret things, which is, where, which is where this all becomes important. So being able to find and repurpose uh, historical know-how, law firm know-how, also goes to onboarding new associates, uh, increasing their speed to value, preserving institutional knowledge when partners depart, um, but also automating uh, simpler tasks like client onboarding, you know, timekeeper and staff recruitment using psycholinguistics to identify the characteristics of people who are successful so that you can hire more of those people. Um, matter resourcing and costing. So who are you going to staff on a matter like this? Um, is there a connection between a, a cost effective uh, and, and uh, for the client and um, you know, profitable for you mixture of staffing? Uh, that, that is there a signal that identifies that there's for certain matters there's a certain staffing mix that tends to work? Predictive budgeting um, so that you can delight your clients uh, by, uh, by coming in according to the expectations that were originally set. And then litigation prediction and scenario modeling, if then exploration. The other, maybe the more radical uh, approach, which I think is, I, if you had asked me in January, I would have said the following approach would, would be uh, five years away. Now I'm going to say two. Uh, and this would involve, um, you know, this third category would involve two strategies. They both have to do with creating products. So if you're a law firm, uh, again, you have the data and the know-how and, the, and the, the, the clients, the brand, and, and a lot of vendors don't. Now, um, even if you're not interested in, in building and selling software, um, there will be increasingly more businesses that will help you. They'll bring the software, they'll bring it around, they'll build it around you, they'll give you the intellectual property rights in it, uh, and you'll bring your know-how. And it will all become easier to train. Uh, training AI in the future will be done by lawyers. Uh, it will be done out of respect for the fact that they have to bill for time, take your user as you find them, and it will look like briefing a case. Um, this, that's a year away. So the two, the two strategies here are, one, focus on high volume legal work that companies generally spend the most amount of money for when they hire outside counsel. Um, this differs across the world, but in, in the United States, I'll give you an example. So, you, so let's suppose you were to create a solution for companies to use um, to predict settlement patterns in employment in workplace discrimination suits. Um, you know, in the U.S. last year, 99,000 workplace discrimination suits were filed, uh, and most of them, uh, by concentration, 44,000 of them, uh, were retaliatory discharge claims, which cost $160,000 per claim on average in attorney's fees uh, to, to handle and take 318 days on average to resolve, usually by settlement. Um, well, can you triage some of those for earlier settlement? Can you help your client base? Can you create a tool that reads your client's data like you do? Now, you might say that you're cannibalizing your revenue if you do something like this already and you do it manually, but it's going to be automated. Uh, if not by you, then, then by someone. Uh, that will happen, um, especially now. There's a financial incentive, and again, you know, uh, there's venture capital being invested in this. People are looking for opportunities. They might not do it well, uh, but they're going to at least create market confusion by claiming that they can do it, uh, which unfortunately happens a lot in our industry. Uh, but, but thank goodness that the legal technology space is maturing and, and now uh, we can tell the difference uh, collectively, I think, between over-promising and not over-promising. Um, in large part, that should again be based upon a front-end assessment and no cost. Um, but you know, suppose that you, you, you create the solution um, and you license it to your clients. You would, the goal would be to get a larger piece of the pie to get more of that type of work. The other approach is to focus not on high volume litigation, and I'm almost done, uh, not on high volume litigation, but on something that you are uh, uh, 
a specialty practice. Suppose, for example, that you focus on private mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and suppose that you've done hundreds of deals. And suppose further that you focus on uh, IT companies, so IT M&A. And you're known for that and you're renowned for that. Well, there's no, obviously there's no what's market database for private deals uh, because the structure is, uh, is non-standard. Um, and this is true in most countries. Um, you know, and if, if, if you, but if you have enough data, you can create a market. If you have enough, if there's no what's market database, but you've done enough deals, you can say, we, we, we know the standard. We, we kind of, we understand what things look like and what things are. And we're going to say that our standard is the standard, at least for intellectual property, I'm sorry, at least for IT uh, m and in, in that, in this hypothetical. Uh, and then you, you basically create a tool that takes your know-how and, uh, uh, you know, um, identifies, it, it conducts diligence, it analyzes regulatory approvals, it researches, you know, what's market again, according to your historical data, it, it can help, help negotiate acquisition documents. And here's why it might make sense to do this. One, no one has, um, you know, uh, and, and different versions of it are okay. Maybe we're wrong as, a, as, a, as an industry to look for one what's market database. We can all have variations and shards, but consider this, consider that, you know, um, M&A transactions uh, you know, that are valued at about 5 million US dollars, they drive the greatest concentration of M&A activity by volume. And for the majority of deals valued at, at, at that at about 5 million, um, bankers tend to earn a success fee, four to 6%, four to 6%. Um, and the market generally supports those fees. So why can't a law firm capture them? If you can use your know-how to, to provide you know, superior firm-enabled AI, again, to focus on diligence, uh, approvals, um, what's market according to you, and, uh, and to negotiate acquisition documents, because you would have the benchmark data. Uh, the banks won't, or if they do, they, they likely won't have uh, digitized it or transformed it. Those are examples, but ultimately, you know, it, it, it comes down to an alignment around uh, what's important to you now, uh, rather than a hammer looking for a nail. Um, as a business, as a law firm, do you need to take out costs? Do you need to generate revenue? Which practices? Why? And then, you know, ideating through the use of design thinking um, and seeing what, what it makes sense to do and what you have the data to support. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then creating a plan for transformation. So uh, I will pause there. But um, are there any questions? Hey, Brian, thank you very much. Certainly um, a topic for further discussion. A lot of uh, very relevant information that you share about these big seismic, uh, seismic changes uh, happening and how. One, let me get started with this question, then we'll go to uh, uh, the chat. They're showing some questions. But how fast are, are, are law firms responding to this? Uh, huge changes in, in expectation in the use of uh, technology? That's a great question. Uh, not as fast as their clients are. Their, their, their clients are working with non-traditional players and vendors, um, particularly after, well, during and in the aftermath of uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, law departments are 64% busier on average uh, than they were in the past. Um, and so, you know, they, they're looking for uh, automation as a way of releasing the, the, you know, the, the pressure and doing more with less. Um, at the same time, a lot of law firms have had to reduce headcount. And so that's forcing law departments to increase programs that they already had in place uh, uh, for digitization and digital transformation. Um, on the law department side. On the law firm side, uh, it's beginning, it, now it's really, I think, be, beginning to, to gain momentum. Um, the, the big challenge is where do I start? That's what the real challenge seems to be. Even for large law firms that have hired groups of data scientists and have very sophisticated technology uh, experience, um, you know, even there, it's where do we start from a business perspective 
that's the challenge. And that's, that's what's not quite yet happening, but beginning to happen. You mentioned that uh, based on a survey data, 43% of uh, legal work has been transferred from law firm or law firm environment to the in-house counsel. How does that affect or what is the trend uh, or expected trend of, of that number as law firms try to implement these new solutions or these new experiences and uh, take it back to one of the questions in the in the group is what happens when a law firm provides certain solutions let's say for contract uh, management or contract formation and then the the, the company the client or the in-house department start using their own uh, solution or a third-party provider how, how do you manage those interactions that's why the data is so important it's it's as you build solutions um, it's less about the technology it's less about the, your client using a contract solution and, and, and you offering a contract solution. It is about that, but it's also about how can you, can you create a contract solution that you can customize to your client based upon your service of them in the past, based upon what you know of their industry. And if you can use machine learning to kind of uh, uh, continuously improve and identify insights, then you begin to build a moat based upon your experience with your client that an external vendor would have difficulty doing uh, because the external data vendor is just using the client's data. They're not necessarily also using other data that you have from similar engagements with other similar clients. Um, I think making that distinction is going to be a difficult argument uh, for people that are unfamiliar with it to begin with, because a lot of people will think, you know, one AI is like another, or one contract solution is, is like another. What is different, what makes it fundamentally different is the degree to which it helps solve your client's problem. And if yours can be tailored in such a way that it does that better, uh, then the other becomes generic and yours becomes much more valuable. So that if, if, if we take it to that comment that you made on uh, the law firms are using only 15% of legacy data, that's, that's your point. That's the opportunity yeah. area for law firms, right? Right, exactly. Uh, explore what what needs your clients have, um, and then explore what those needs are worth in terms of what, what is the financial benefit to your client of solving them? And then what is, of course, the financial benefit to you? And then you can prioritize what to do uh, and then identify if you have enough data to support it. But if you do, you're creating something differentiated. And with each engagement, with each time your client uses it, it will improve. Um, and it will improve based upon, very importantly, you know, your own know-how. Um, and you can say, you know, we, uh, 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 law firm X, we trained this. It reflects our reasoning and you trust our reasoning. Who trained their data? Who trained the vendor's data? You know, th this is branded, trustworthy know-how. So trust is a big part of it too. And uh, getting to the end of the, of the presentation, but give us your sense on two last topics. Uh, if you can share a concrete examples on, on how legal services based on IA have been transformed or that you have that, that experience with your clients as they transform into using this technology to serve these purposes. Sure. I'll give you a, a law department example because we've spoken mostly about law firms. Um, is, uh, and, and, and we also work with law departments. Um, so based upon my own experience, I uh, uh, created a tool um, that helps companies reduce outside counsel spend. And it does so in three ways. It uses artificial intelligence to automate invoice review. Um, and, and this is custom for every, for every uh, customer. So you know, if you're an insurance company, uh, the way that a lawyer describes narratively in their invoices uh, uh, the activities that they, that they engage in is different from lawyer to lawyer. So we use machine learning to identify uh, what, what, what all those different descriptions have in common. Um, and then we contextualize them for different matter types. Again, my example earlier of, of automobile bodily injury negligence and director and officer liability, different semantics. 
Uh, once we are able to do that, we're able to identify root causes. In other words, uh, what are lawyers doing that tends to produce the results that companies want, um, the outcomes, and who's doing so more cost effectively and who's doing so faster. So we can go from invoice uh, review to uh, root cause analysis. So customers can identify, uh, law departments can identify sort of the, what it takes to represent them and to benchmark that price, to benchmark outcomes, to being able to predict timing and amount of settlement, to being able to predict budget. And you know, in, in one case, our, a, large, um, a large property and casualty, a large automobile insurer with a, an outside council spend of over a billion dollars, um, you know, saw a multi hundred million dollar benefit case. Uh, it's important to note though, that this is only, this is transformative, but there's a catch. And the catch is uh, high volume litigation. Um, there has to be enough data for the AI to identify insights. And if there isn't, then, uh, you know, that then, you know, if, if you're a large company and you are sued for a thousand things every year, a thousand different, different categories of litigation, um, many more lawsuits, but a, a thousand categories, and four of those categories drive 30% of your outside counsel spend by volume or whatever, the majority of your outside counsel spend by volume, you know, it makes sense to focus on those things. But the other, there might not be enough data for something like this to be helpful. So one of the trends that we're seeing and, and with us and with others, and there's a law firm version of this too, but uh, uh, you know, is um, it's the idea that high volume litigation, because there's more data associated with it, uh, is, is what, what everybody's focused on um, in terms of startups and vendors and use. And, and that's where the most competition exists. Um, it won't always be the case. And you'll be able to get to, to do more with less data going forward. Um, but wherever there's more data, you're able to see a transformation. And that transformation also involves change management and process. So it's, it's not just technology. It's basically, uh, in this case, it's outside council spend transformation enabled with custom technology, a toolkit. Um, by analyzing your current state processes and what needs to be changed to get to the future state. And that's unique unto you. Um, and so you know, we, we assemble these tools around your unique business case uh, with, with, with a kit that we've created that can be taken apart and put together in different ways. Uh, that results in a transformation, um, you know, because it is in that case using, if you're a company, your data uh, to identify insights um, that, that represent value to you and, and savings opportunities to you. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you. Uh, Thank a you. A lot of content that uh, we, we have to review, certainly to kind of do a deep dive on all the data and the analysis and, and comments that you share with us. And before, well, while Alex changes the, the screens just to show the last uh, slide, uh, you've been all over the place. Uh, you travel the world constantly uh, before with IBM, now with Elevate. What's your perception on the maturity level as you, as you transfer through uh, region to region? And how do you see that compared with kind of the expectation or the possibility that you can encounter as a company or, or as a reality that we face in Latin America? I think that it all depends. There, the maturity curve is important. There, there are digital maturity curves um, and, and they, they're things that can be shared and they'll, you know, different vendors will have different perspectives and different consultancies like, you know, like us, different perspectives on what that is and what the steps are. But ultimately any organization uh, that has a lot of data um, in electronic form, you know, doesn't have to go rung by rung, rung up that later, ladder. They can, they can leap ahead. And it's really about wherever, wherever an organization is located in the world, do they have enough data? Do they have that data in electronic form? Um, that is the fundamental question. And so you know, what we're finding is that across the world, the 
the financial services industry and the law firms that serve the financial services industry. And when I say that, I mean banking and insurance uh, tend to be driving this. Um, you know, uh, we also find though that no matter what the maturity level is, uh, you know, local, local regulations play a big role in what organizations are willing to do, like GDPR, for example. Um, even if they can and want to uh, easily do more, um, there might be uh, legal limitations in place uh, preventing that from happening. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that pans out. Um, I think though that, uh, you know, certainly looking at, thinking back to my IBM days and looking at the, the, the work that IBM did in Latin America with some of the large banks, um, it was, and this was not necessarily for legal, that really was what drove um, the artificial intelligence space. And I think the same is true now uh, when it comes to, again, the financial services, also insurance industry, um, uh, they tend to have a lot of data and the law firms that serve them. Excellent. Brian, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in Mexico in October at the, at the Legal Summit. I look forward to it as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Alex? Well, for this coming Thursday, we have uh, Sylvia Hodges Silverstein. And this is going to be another very interesting seminar that has been uh, very much uh, looked for. And she's going to be talking about uh, international legal procurement. So this is one not to miss. And it's going to be at 11 a.m. Mexico City time. And also, very quickly, uh, if you want, if one do want to share the legal tech competition that we just started, we just launched this competition. The idea is to bring uh, Latin American talent in the legal tech startup uh, arena. So you'll find uh, information on our website on how to apply for it. If you have people, friends, colleagues uh, that are dealing with this area, please uh, uh, let them know that uh, we're here and uh, taking these registrations during this month. And in the chat, you have the link to connect to this legal tech competition uh, rules. And also, as we mentioned, in October 15, we're going to have a physical summit. It's going to call uh, Legal Vision 2020. And you can find all the information about it in legalsummit.lowitgroup.com. There you can find the registration link. And it's a 500 seat event. It's a full day from basically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we're bringing a lot of international speakers. Uh, Brian's going to be one of them. And then we also have uh, a lot of local talent sharing what's up to date in the post COVID-19 uh, applications in the legal industry. And as we finish all the time uh, with this phrase, in time of turbulence, the biggest danger is to act with yesterday's logic. So it is time to reinvent ourselves, to basically forget all the things that are no longer working and that the customers don't think they add any value to their systems and start getting into the new value added technologies and services that are most likely what the customers will be looking for in our uh, law firm or in our legal department uh, specialty. So with this, we thank you for joining us. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have you here and looking forward to seeing you on Thursday with the upcoming webinar. And just to remind you that on our YouTube channel, Lowit Group, we have all the recordings of the webinars and they're available for you to use and to share with friends and to review the information that sometimes as they come in half an hour, 40 minutes is, is too much information, but then we have always the time to go back and review and revisit some of the ideas and the content that our guests and our host uh, share. So thank you very much and looking forward to seeing you. Bye. Thanks for connecting. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you, John. Have a nice day.